Okay, so I think we're live. Uh, so good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are uh, in the world. Uh, this panel is about caring leadership. Uh, my name is Faisal Haq. Uh, I'm the founder of Uh, global 2000 customer, but also with uh, US federal government. Um, so I'm the moderator. I'm going to set the stage and then my panelists, which which you'll, you'll hear from them and a pretty eclectic and accomplished uh, group of people. They will give their own bent on uh, what they mean by caring leadership and how they're applying it in their own professional and personal lives, uh, but also what they're learning from the people they work with. Um, so, um, you know, I mean, as we know, the world has changed significantly in last, uh, you know, 12, specifically last uh, 12 months. And I kind of look at this change uh, uh, that that's being driven by four different uh, factors. Uh, one is obviously pandemic, uh, which we are all uh, recipient uh, of it, and hence we are all doing this virtual conference. Uh, but there's also other factors, like there's a massive uh, climate uh, shift that's going on globally. There's a technology shift that's going on uh, globally. And there's also uh, lots of misinformation that's going on globally. So all of those is a perfect uh, storm uh, for change and change uh, from the context of personal, professional, organizational, governmental point of view. So there are, we have a very interesting group of uh, panelists that kind of represent all of this sector. Uh, and we all have personal or professional uh, experience to talk about. So in my uh, case, you know, I mean, the way I look at uh, caring leadership is that, um, you know, it, caring leadership comes from empathy. Uh, caring leadership comes from uh, understanding the change that are happening outside, but also change that is happening internally among each one of us. And uh, that kind of uh, uh, gives us an opportunity to be transformational because transformational leadership uh, by definition is uh, somebody who is uh, inspired in influence and establish uh, systemic uh, uh, enablement that allows uh, personal growth, but also organizational growth and at the end, um, um, you know, the community and, and global growth. So we will talk about all that, uh, you know, in the panel. And the way we are kind of going about this panel is that each panelist will have about five minutes uh, to talk about their own stories uh, and their own experiences. And then we'll come back and have a uh, Q&A session. So, uh, so that's how we'll do it. And in my case, I have noticed this as a entrepreneur, uh, my own challenge to grow my businesses, but I've also noticed this uh, this kind of shift and, and leadership changes among the government leaders that I work with at the highest level of our US government. But I've also looked at, I've noticed these changes that's going on uh, in my own home where my spouse is a working professional, works actually for a reinsurance organization and works for uh, uh, in their HR uh, organization, so she's noticing those changes. Um, my son is a, uh, a freshman, so he, he started his schooling in a very odd time or an interesting time, so he is, we tried both online and offline schooling, so we're experiencing those changes, as you can imagine. And uh, in my case, you know, because of my work is both private sector and, and public sector, um, you know, it's been kind of interesting to notice the, uh, you know, the, the differences uh, because uh, when I work with my government uh, leaders, the, that environment is very secure and uh, we're all working from home. So it creates a different kind of uh, challenges. So I, I'll, I'll come back to all this at the end after all the panelists has a chance to say their own stories and share their own personal uh, experiences to kind of wrap it up and have a Q&A session. So I'm going to pass it, pass the mic to, to uh, Alexis, uh, and maybe Alexis, you can introduce yourself and uh, take us to the next level. Thank you. Hi, 
everyone. I'm Alexis Brotsis. I have the pleasure of serving as Chief People Officer for Alumo. Alumo is a human analytics technology firm, and we're focused on elevating the humanistic qualities experienced um, by everyone in daily life, whether that be at work or in your community. Um, <clears throat> You know, 2020 was like a monumentous year. It delivered compounding global crisis. You know, for the first time in history, we all experienced this together collectively um, as one. It impacted us all in, in real time. And no one has been left, left unscathed by this pandemic or the social injustices that we've seen and experienced or the economic downturn that, um, you know, we're all still experiencing. Uh, no one is is left, you know, without being touched by this. And the challenges of the last 12 months have really forced us to to adjust and adapt more quickly than ever before. You know, we've seen that that um, nearly half of all of the employees, their work environment has has changed dramatically, you know, through the last 12 month period. Um, and. Within any crisis, though, there's always a hidden opportunity, and I really try to focus on that within my own personal leadership um, to to find that silver lining in that light. And now that we've finally been able to catch our breaths a bit at this moment in time uh, within the last 12 months um, and thinking back and, and what we've all experienced, we've all um, had had been forced to in, increase our resiliency. And and we've also had to practice patience like never before, as we still are, because we we don't know um, we don't know what our new normal is going to be yet. Um, and with that, we also have to practice patience with others. Um, we are also prioritizing relationships. Um, you know, we see that within our families. We see that within our community and we see that within our organizations in which we work for. Um, you know, we've really come together like like never before. Um, and that really is established through this like continuous communication that that is provided for us through platforms, um, you know, via the Internet and technology. But never before in history has everything been this accessible. Never have we would have had a, a meeting as such across different continents and time zones. Um, so there, there is some, there is some benefit to it, to this experience that we've gone through, you know. And empirical research shows that um, caring is a basic human propensity. Uh, we are, we are all um, programmed to care, even though in in daily life, I think we tend to to lose focus of that. Um, and through that, in that caring leadership, um, you know, the authoritarian leadership is no longer a tolerable approach. And we must begin to see people as humans instead of as profit centers or cost centers. And through this collective hardship that we've all experienced in 2020, I think we're seeing this positive shift. Um, we are in experiencing an increase um, of the adoption of like the servant leadership style, where leaders are beginning to put the needs of their people um, firsthand and helping them develop and perform as highly as possible. Um, as opposed to uh, just asking for, for more and more, you're understanding the needs um, of those within your organizations. And the only way that that is accomplished is through communication and an open dialogue in which, um, you know, people can share freely without, you know, fear of retaliation and bullying or, um, or fear for, for their jobs, their lives, their family, their livelihood. So we are seeing, I think, a shift in that, um, you know, and the leaders that are cultivating a positive culture are, are seeing an increase in engagement and productivity, um, even while this, this pandemic is, is going on. Um, there, are, there are a number of organizations that have, have um, you know, really put up incredible numbers during this, this time. And, you know, those those people that are, are are doing so within the positive leadership, in that servant leadership style, you know, they're providing an environment for their people um, that creates a, a, a greater physical health um, amongst their people as well. And, you know, it's inspiring the team through the shared mission of a common purpose. And to me, that's really what caring leadership speaks to.
So I wanted to go ahead and then pass it over to Jet and and have her give her experience and her background on that. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for setting the scene also to Faisal. Um, I'm excited to participate in this panel because this is really, uh, it lies very close to my heart, all this caring leadership, uh, 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 I would say different uh, themes, different uh, topics on that. Uh, I'm a Dane. I'm not a Dane, but I'm a Dane. Uh, and I think as uh, the only one here, uh, I'm not based in the U.S., but I am based in Denmark. Um, I have a background in business. Um, I had held various uh, uh, positions in uh, large corporates, in uh, SMEs and in startups. And uh, I am also in my work very inspired uh, by the Danish existentialist, uh, Søren Kierkegaard, even though I am actually a master in business administration. So I am trying to build bridges between these two things. And my passion is the future. And the, the, the way that I see that is that we have to build bridges to a better future, to a better business in the future. And I do that by working within leadership and strategy. I'm a strategic advisor. I do some board work and I do also work as an external associate professor at the University of Southern Denmark, doing change management and doing business development. And for 15, over more than 15 years, I've been running my own companies, working with uh, businesses, leaders, managers, uh, and also uh, employees. And I would like to build on what was uh, has already been said by Faisal and Alexis, uh, actually build on the, the mega trends. And I would like to outline a couple of key points that I have in what I called hardcore leadership. And heart is spelled like heart because my heart is actually very close to this. The first one, uh, the first point is actually vision and purpose. Um, I think nothing happens without a purpose. Nothing happens without it makes sense to people. I see that when I teach. I mean, there's no student, no student at all, just doing anything because I say so or to please me. Not a chance. Uh, they they need a purpose for themselves. Uh, they need a perspective uh, for each individual. And I do also see it in my daily work, in my own leadership, and also in the work I do with leaders and managers. Sometimes they ask in, more and in despair, but also with a twinkle. But I don't, they just do what I tell them to. And we can have a, a good discussion about that. And uh Often it is a question of uh, failing purpose or no sense. And this is also communication and dialogue, as Alexis also said. It, it, is, it is a problem that we are not good enough at going into these dialogues. And this tends actually to be, uh, uh, I would say, more important towards the younger generations, uh, which is not very, well, that's not, that's not rocket science, because when you're younger, you need a, a better, a more frame setting uh, environment. And then we haven't even talked about nationalities, gender, race, religion, whatever diff the differences we might have. And I would say in an, in smaller countries like Denmark, which are open economies, it, it is very important that we go into this discussion. The other point I would like to make is what I call from top down, top down to up and down and around. This means that I think many of us have been working with managers and been trained with managers. Uh, we actually wanted control over everything and everybody. And I have to confess, I was such a manager years ago. And I think that many of you know that that's the case. But the classical top-down manager needs or knows everything and just keeps on running to reach or to achieve own KPIs, scared of doing failures, not wanting to cooperate or collaborate with others. No, that, that's, that's, not, that's not the future manager. But anyhow, I think when we, when we look into what you have also been saying, that it's a complex, it's an uncertain, it's a highly globalized, globalized world, we, we have to cooperate. We, we, no, no individual can cope alone. We need what I call combined skills and intelligence. 
And the impl implication of that more collaborative and shaping leadership style is that we have to work together. We need to learn together. We need to reflect together and we need to do failures together because the, the failure is necessary to grow. The failure is necessary to learn. So this is what I call up and down and around because that needs, that's a balanced leadership. So there's no leader actually uh, being able to lead in the old way where I know everything type. That's, that's really not a, 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 a way to do it in, in the future. Also because that type of leader is afraid of doing the failure. There's no vulnerability in that leader type. So it, it, I would say actually this comes rather natural to us in Denmark. It, it's not very, uh, it's not very far away from our culture. We have low, low power distance here. We are, we ask questions, a lot of questions. We challenge our leaders. We've been doing that for years. We have a well, well developed flex security system in society, et cetera. But that does not mean that it comes easy to us. It does not. It is also very, very hard for us to work on that agenda. So that is actually the hardcore leadership because we need mind, we need body, we need soul. Uh, we need all three things, which is actually uh, the empathy that Faisal was was raising as as an, uh, a theme and this is also the relationship thing that, that Alexis mentioned. So we have to put ourselves in the game on stake at risk. Uh, that means that you cannot hide anymore behind an education, behind a title, behind a position, whatever in the organization. You need, you need to step forward and be a person. And what happens if we don't? Well, I think then we'll just be leaders of the past, not of the future. So thank you very much. That was uh, the key points I had. I'm not really sure who the next in the flow is. I forgot, but I know that Faisal can help me. Thank you. Uh, it's actually Andrew. So Andrew is the next in line. So Andrew, uh, all yours. How exciting. Uh, well, yeah, uh, great to be here with everyone today. Uh, Andrew Sherman, uh, co-founder of Leaders Atlas, dialing in from Boston. Um, don't hold it against me, but, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I've had, uh, a bit of, uh, you know, my own kind of leadership journey, uh, as I've gone along here, uh, coming out of college, I was a teacher in rural China and out of that experience, I founded a nonprofit that worked in rural China to get eyeglasses for students. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, that's called Education Insight. We've been able to deliver over 400,000 eye exams out there. But since then, you know, I, my, my, my own experience has evolved. Uh, I've also had the opportunity to lead, uh, the global shapers, uh, in Beijing, uh, and, you know, build a community from kind of go from zero to one there. Uh, and now these days, uh, I'm in the for profit world as the co founder of Leaders Atlas. And what we do is help leaders. Uh, understand the talents, the superpowers of their people, uh, and give them a platform for, for getting those skills, that experience shared across their teams, across their company. Uh, and, uh, you know, a, a lot of what everyone's saying around, around carrying leadership, uh, is, is resonating a, a ton here, uh, with, with my own experience and, you know, the experience we have working with leaders. You know, I've had the opportunity to see, NGO leadership, for-profit leadership, now even government leadership with some of the work we're doing. Uh, and I think, you know, one of the things that, that stands out to me and one of the, the ways I like to kind of frame up leadership challenges is, is in terms of generations. Uh, and you know, I don't know if anybody's kind of familiar with, uh, generations theory. There's a lot of different ways they put it, three generations theory. Uh, but you know, the idea is that, uh, you know, there's, there's a founding generation, uh, you know, where, where, uh, the 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 vision for something coalesces uh, and launches. Then the second generation is all about scaling that up, really optimizing it, make decisions to escalate it. And then the third generation is you know by by the time the third generation comes around, uh, you know many of the founding people are no longer a part of the conversation. They've kind of lost that. Uh, yet uh, to to your you know to your point, they've lost that vision. They've lost that purpose, that drive, uh, and they need to define a new one. 
And, you know, it's the third generation where sometimes you see crises break out because there's nothing bringing people together anymore. Or sometimes you're able to successfully navigate the tra that transition uh, and coalesce around a new identity and go through that. And I feel like, you know, what I'm seeing in the United States or even, you know, companies, you know, are you know, blue chip, the Microsofts or the McKinsey's or the HP's is this, this really, really consequential third generation transition taking place. And it's a, it's, it's a tough spot for a leader to be in, uh, because you have to, you know, not just know where you are today, but you have to know where everything's going and you have to navigate that really successfully. And I think that a huge part of the conversation, you know, especially around this, uh, is you know, how good of a leader can you be? How caring of a leader can you be to navigate that transition? Um, second generation, it's all about optimizing. I, I, you know, I, I think, uh, maybe it was Alexis or Yeta who said it. It's that kind of authoritarian leadership where it's like, we're here to grow. We're here to cut costs. We're here to escalate profits. That's it. Third generation, not about that anymore. Uh, we have to respect our people. We have to talk to our people and understand what, you know, what our vision is going to be for the future so we can all get there together. Uh, and I think that COVID has really escalated this conversation for a lot of people. People were very comfortable just doing that second generation thing and they can't do that anymore. Uh, now they have to, you know, provide psychological safety for their people. They have to, uh, you know, they have to help navigate not just work challenges, but life challenges and they have to be there for the people around them. And the leaders who are doing that right now are getting a lot of great recognition. And the leaders who are not doing that uh, are falling out of their institutions. So I think it's really more important now than ever that, you know, this idea of caring leadership emerges and people ask themselves, are they that caring leader? Are they adopting that? And are they, you know, are they, are they doing right by their people? And the, the leaders who do that uh, are going to get recognized for it. You know, it's, it's more apparent the, the information is out there for people to know. At least huge transition just occurred and we're all aware of it. Uh, but they bled people over the past four years and now they need to get new blood, in, right? Uh, because of that lack of caring leadership. Uh, and I think we're seeing the same thing with 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 companies and, and a lot of organizations going through that third generation. Uh, and so uh, just to kind of, I guess, bring it all together here, uh, I think, you know, leaders need to uh, rise to the challenge that they never, a lot of them never asked for or never expected, uh, but are in the situation of. Uh, and you know, I'm really glad that we can have this conversation here to to pull out some of these ideas and really kind of lock them in because these are the things that are going to carry us into, you know, the next generation of leadership and really define the next 20, 30 years of what it means to be in a government institution or in a corporation or in an NGO or anything like that. Uh, so that's my piece. Uh, and then I think, is it Angelique next? Is that right? Yes. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Um, I'm Angelique, as you said. I'm from Suriname. Um, I am I am the chair of a political party, Democratic Alternative 91, and I am uh, an, an ambassador and working with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs with uh, my my special my specialization in uh, diplomacy is contemporary diplomacy and especially public diplomacy, having all to do with communication and and uh, sending messages. Um, but let me get back to what uh, to the caring leadership. I, of course, I'm very honored to be part of this panel to this afternoon, um, and to share with you my experience and my thoughts on on caring leadership. Um, when I think about caring leadership, um, I actually the first thing that comes to mind in my country is the way business and meetings are done uh, in our tribal communities. Because when we go to our tribal communities, and I have the experience there having been an associate director for the Peace Corps and also as a politician, uh, going there to, to get the people on board with new ideas and, um, and to have them cooperate and be successful in their villages. But what you find is that when you look back on the experience of having those meetings, is that they're one of the best examples 
of the requirement for caring leadership for success. Because when you go into those meetings, um, as from the start, from the introductions to each other, it requires um, a, a sense of respect for each other. It has, you need to be respect, very respectful. It requires you to listen to each other. Um, you cannot speak while the other one is speaking. You just have to listen until the, the message is done from the one side before you can react, which be, requires you really to listen and come back with a response, not, not just your message. And, and the second, the, the other thing there is, is that you have to show cultural, uh, uh, how do you say it, knowledge. Right? So you need, you, they, they need to experience that you adjust to their culture, that you, that you are interested in their culture, and that you learn their culture, their traditions, which is the foundation for building trust. But that's not all, because at the end of it all, we, you need to eat together. You need to sit with them and have a meal together, sometimes even from one plate. And that all of that has to do with laying the foundation of trust, showing that you see them for who they are and respect them for who they are and that you're willing to stand in their shoes. And as I was thinking back of, to, to that, preparing for this, for, this, for this meeting this afternoon, I thought to myself, how funny that we never def defined it as caring leadership. We just accepted it as part of the way we do business. But now in the post-COVID era, now that we feel, we all sense as leaders that we have to change, that things cannot go back the way they were, um, all the challenges we, we have to get across, suddenly we realize that all, this, all the while that our tribal communities already practiced caring leadership. Actually, they had it as a base, as a foundation for all for the all over leadership of their communities, because it's also in, in those communities um, solidarity is a very important uh, issue. You cannot accomplish anything without solidarity, without volunteerism. Volunteerism. So it was for me very uh, for me myself living in my own country an eye opener preparing for this panel and realizing that this that the best example of caring leadership was in my own country already and that I had gone through it many, many times. So when we are here in, in, in Suriname, um, with, the, with the changes, and I've listened to all, all the other panel members, and a lot of what they say resonates with me. I like the three, the gen, the three generation uh, ID by Andrew, and I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm gonna borrow the hardcore uh, word, the, 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 how do you say that? The, the example of hardcore and the way you spell it from yet the, I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to borrow it and use it a lot here in Suriname because that is what it all comes down to for me when you talk about uh, caring leadership. And the other side of the medal is that when I was talking in preparing for this with other people, which I usually do, I talk to them, I say, I'm going to talk about caring leadership, um, what, what comes to mind when you hear that. Um, I found that a lot of people in, in Suriname First, they thought of women. When they heard caring leadership, the first thing that comes to mind is women and mothers because they're always listening and trying to find solutions for everybody. But another thing that was not, that I was not so happy with was that they felt like it was weak leadership. The idea of caring seems to make them think it's weak, which for me, I translated as being, uh, as actually telling me um, the sense of, uh, how do you say it, democratic experience they have, we have in our countries. We are still used to leaders telling us what to do and not leaders who are sitting down and listening to us. So we feel as if when a leader sits down and is willing to listen to us, that they don't know what to do. So that's why they're listening. So they must be weak. And that, that is a challenge um, in, in, in countries like mine that have, that are not there, that have not that, uh, how do you say it, long experience of democracy, um, you know, and, 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 and a strong civil society, that people have to understand now that they have a right to make demands and that the leaders who listen will be better able to bring the solutions they need. So I felt when hearing that, that that is a special uh, task for all of us who are leaders, not just in my country, but in countries like mine, developing countries. Um, in this post-COVID era, where we also experienced, you know, a lot of our liberties and freedoms were, were limited. Um, 
and now we have to use a lot of the new technology to reach each other and exchange ideas. That we, in that same process, we have to put more emphasis on making our citizens aware that um, asking questions, um, having criteria, discussing and asking responsibility from leaders is normal. It's actually needed to get this caring leadership. And that caring leadership actually is at the basis of very strong leadership if you wish to have a good future. So for me, it's 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 very, um, how do you say it? Um, it, 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 it is, uh, on the one hand, very positive, and on the other hand, it's very challenging. Because um, when you live in countries that are multicultural, multi-ethnic, you, as a leader, you have to be like a chameleon. And nowadays, people are even more sensitive about, uh, about certain issues than before because we are a culture of people who come together. The personal contact is the most important to talk about things. Now we have to go to use the, of the Internet, which in itself can be a, a positive benefit, as, as some of you were saying, because we can participate in a lot more sessions and examiners and trainings. But on the other hand, how do we deal with the feeling of distance? Because the personal meetings are not there anymore to build to build the trust and to have the feeling of connectedness. Now you have to do it from behind the screen. Another issue with that is the access. Because some people don't have access. It, it's too expensive for them to have access. Or, or the, the connection is bad, as I've seen even today during the other meetings of harasses that some speakers just they disappear and they come back and they disappear. So that, that that's how it works. Um, so, so there are certain challenges. For us as leaders, for me and my experience, I find that I cannot do things as I was used to. I cannot just call a big meeting and have people come in here because it's against the law. We can only have 10 people in a room at one time. So I need to go out more to talk to people. I need to, to be able more to, to stand in other people's shoes, to speak the language that touches their heart without them seeing me or, or touching me personally. Because that, 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 you know, that, that is the, the thing they miss, the, the disconnect they have. They see you from behind the screen or on the TV or here on the radio. So, and at the same time, all of the people here, we have so many different ethnic groups, they all want to be recognized for their uniqueness. At the same time, we need to bring them to the interconnectedness that we need to move forward. Um, our president spoke earlier today at, Horas, at the Horasis meeting also, and he, also, he, 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 he noted the challenges we have um, to go through not only the post-COVID era, but also the, the huge financial economic problem we, we face at this moment. So we need to have some with unification, people feeling each other and feeling connected with each other. But due to COVID, we have been presented with even more challenges in connecting and uniting the people. So it requires, let me just summarize it in, as such, that we need to have success in nation building at this time. We need to have people feel that they're seen and recognized for who they personally are. So we need inspirational leadership, and you cannot have that without the caring leadership. It is a special task for all of us. We have to move beyond our own boundaries, you know, whether it's physical, whether it's ethnically, culturally. We have to move beyond those boundaries. We have to show more solidarity and be willing to listen to those who not necessarily see things the same way as we do. And the only way we can do that is by... How do you say that? Um, lead by example. That is what we need to do. They need to hear and see us listen. They need to see that what they tell us is being used in policies and in the way we present the ideas. Because if we only listen and don't do anything with the ideas they share with us, they feel like they weren't listened to at all. It was a waste of their time. Since they, they, they are not very strong, uh, how do you say that? In experience in democracy because we're a very young democracy. We also need to make them aware that they have the right to speak, how to speak, and what the tools are that are available. So, 
challenge. Actually, is I, it okay if we is it okay if we pass it to Grant? I know we're we're just a little pressed for time. Yes, yes, yes. I'm gonna pass it to Greg. I'm just finishing, so I pass it to Greg. <laughs> Thank you, Angelique. Uh, great to be on this panel. Uh, good to see everyone, and a special thanks to Frank for putting such an amazing event together. Uh, I'm Grant Schreiber, the founding editor of Real Leaders Magazine, um, which has been going for about 12 years now. We focus on sustainable leadership and ethical biz uh, business, and we're trying to promote actionable ideas for uh, companies and leaders around the world by showing them um, the actions of like-minded leaders um, that are moving the world forward. So I'd like to just pick up on something Angelique said earlier. Obviously, there's a lot of bad with social media in the world right now. But I also think it's, uh, in terms of leadership, it's given a, a, a more personal approach to leadership. It's given insights into people's minds. And we have transparency now like never before. Um, if you're a bad leader, there are not many places to hide anymore. Um, you know, WikiLeaks started the whole idea of, of revealing things many, many years ago. I think social media has picked up on that trend. And you now have millions of people around the world with opinions and, you know, asking uh, probing questions and revealing things. Um, and so along with the pandemic of the last year, you've seen a lot of social issues come pouring out as well. And I think that's good for leadership. I think it holds people accountable. Um, it reveals things that, that have traditionally been hidden that, have, that might have been bad. And um, you have to be a good leader today because there are just too many people watching. I think the pandemic in many ways has also created a warlike mentality, which only comes around every couple of generations on a global level. And it's created this idea that we're all in things in this together. People are feeling part of a common cause and people are realizing more increasingly that we actually all need each other in some way. When you see people across the world experiencing the, exactly the same symptoms and stresses and, um, and problems as you, regardless of which country you're in, I think it pulls people together. And I think leaders who take advantage of that sentiment um, will, will be the winners of the future. Um, I've also heard a lot of people say that this past crisis of the last year is good training for the next one. And I think we can always be certain that, that there will always be another crisis coming up. It's just the nature of humanity. But I think the good news is that if we see crisis as an opportunity, then this is where future leaders will define themselves looking for those opportunities in a crisis. Um, I'm also aware that leadership lessons that we've learned from the past year may only surface in the next generation. Um, I'm speaking about our children here. It's, it must have seemed like a very confusing time for them uh, to, to not be at school and to look at their parents and wonder what's going on when they were mostly in a, in a rigid uh, environment with, with a regular routine. And I think we'll probably only see the results of this in the next generation or in the next couple of years. And most importantly, I think they'll be looking at what we did during this time. How did we react as adults, as parents, as leaders, as business leaders? And I think this will have a lasting impression on them. They'll remember this for the rest of their life. Um, I've also noticed that leaders and celebrities from before the pandemic are far less relevant today as they were back then. We've got new leaders who've appeared who uh, no one really thought about a few years ago. People such as frontline health workers, scientists, city mayors, even some CEOs of uh, some social media companies who've taken the initiative. Um, all people uh, who looked at the crisis that we have faced and decided to act bravely, I think, have come out well. Um, a lot of people talk about how you'll be remembered after the crisis, and there are a couple of uh, very good examples in the world right now. Um, when it comes to being a caring leader, I think empathy is a, has got a large part to play. Um, one of the examples I want to share with you is I interviewed Forrest Whitaker many years ago. And people mostly know him as an actor, Star Wars. But when he was growing up, his mother was a, a caregiver, a nurse, and she worked with children with disabilities, mental disabilities. And she would come home every evening and tell Forrest about how she dealt with them, the patience that was needed, the kind of uh, challenges she had to step up to. And this resonated with him deeply. And he told me that that has stayed with him his whole life. And today, not many people know that he's brokering peace deals in southern Sudan. And he can draw a direct line to what his mother taught him as a kid, to the international work he's doing 
at the United Nations and in war-torn areas. So I think leadership can be nurtured in young people. And I think leaders owe the current generation of young people um, the kind of lessons that they will need to need to be shown now to carry through into the leadership lessons of the of the future generations. Um, so yes, how you act now, I think, will define the future. And we're already seeing the fallout and the results of those who didn't manage this process properly over the last year. We've seen it politically and in business uh, in big ways. And I think leaders are now starting to, they're seeking confidence and allies like never before. Um, the structures have all changed, mainly because there are no guidelines for what we've just experienced over the past year. And one of the, the big things for me has been that effective leadership now needs to free itself from the myth of measurement. Uh, measurement's a good tool in business and in government, but it doesn't capture all the truth. Uh, for example, it's difficult to measure good. It's something you can't really put your, your, your metric around very easily. Um, a leader who's got empathy, insights, and skills to capture people's emotions can move people and markets far more effectively than any spreadsheet. Um, so touching so, lives in a meaningful way. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm out of time. I'm, I'm, you know, well, actually, we're all going to be out of time because it sure. will stop us exactly uh, at 1.15. I got okay. already noticed that we're running out. But this is such a complex and interesting uh and deep topic, I think we could probably talk about this rest of the day if we wanted to. Uh, so uh, what I will try to do is I will try to summarize what all of you kind of talked about in one liner from each one of you. I've been taking notes. Uh, so I'll start with, um, you know, um, uh, right after me, what Alexis said, that uh, the, uh, the importance of resiliency and personal relationship uh, is is at a, at a uh, cornerstone, at a cornerstone, is at the cornerstone of uh, uh, this kind of caring leadership because it, uh, you know, it, the caring leadership, as you said, Grant, uh, leadership as it stands today begins with the fact that it starts with personal leadership, how we lead ourselves, uh, you know, transmits to our children, and then it goes on and on. Um, you know, um, uh, we talk about uh, the notion of uh, leading with heart and applying uh, the fact that it, it's hard, it is with heart that you win others because nobody succeeds in silo. You know, we, we have to succeed as a community. Uh, we talked about, uh, um, you know, uh, Andrew talked about the notion of the next generation, uh, third generation leaders needs to take the baton and redefine the purpose. And we are at a stage where we are in the process of redefining ourselves as a globe, as a person, as a company, as a, as a, as a political organization, whatever uh, the case may be. And lastly, uh, uh, Angelique talked a lot about community, community build up and the fact that we, we, um, uh, we have to do that with respect and understanding other people's culture and, you know, the building bonds with trust, you know, having a meal together builds a bond. You know, and I mean, you see that the families who eat together, you know, has much better relationship than families who kind of goes in their corner and don't eat together. You know, it's a, something I know very well, you know, before it came from my parents and I tried to hold on to that, you know, every possible way. Again, I do that with my family. I do that with uh, my uh, employees and the people I work with. So all the things we talked about, you know, it applies at an individual level. It applies at an organizational level. It applies at a community level. It applies at a governmental level. And obviously transparency, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, transparency is, 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 is key to all this. And you're absolutely right. Technology has allowed us to uh, kind of, you know, break that that's a uh, glass wall that, or, you know, maybe not glass wall, but the wall that we used to able to hide uh, with a lot of different things. So I was able to extend uh, in a time, uh, it gave me a chance to extend the time. So probably we could take five minutes and each one of you kind of, uh, you, know, um, uh, uh, you know, do a closing uh, statement. 
I'll I'll go back to Alexis and uh, Alexis, you maybe you can do a closing statement in terms of what we part of what we talked about, and then we can just go around the room again and and have that uh, um, I don't know, roll, roll, roll up. So Alexis. 